everyone. My name is Spencer Walsh. Welcome to today's episode of Newsflash. Apologies for the, the lateness on today's show, but never fear. That means we are getting up-to-date information, carrying you through, um, you know, a broader period of time as really the news continues to take place and take shape thick and fast. On the show today, we have a great piece in the Financial Times really exploring a question that I think a lot of people have been asking. What is behind so many losses and just the pathetic posture that the Biden administration has had towards Israel completely getting its its wishes ignored? Or is it, as I kind of want to raise the question and we have new evidence to back it up in the form of a pro-publica story inside the State Department's weapons pipeline to Israel. We'll also be taking a look at the latest out of the region, the very, very latest. Also, the dock workers strike. We didn't have a chance to cover it on the last show, but it's already over. There has been a new deal for a wage hike and an immediate work resumption. So we're also, we're going to take you through all that. A lot of important stuff to go on the show. And Kamala Harris has really been working hard to try and woo Wall Street recently. The vice president has builded, build, built ties excuse me, with finance bosses in an attempt to quell support from Trump. We'll take a look at what that means for the administration. And we will be taking a look at some polls as well. A lot of big stories and really want to work through them. If you want some of the bonus content, though, some of the stuff that I don't cover on the show, you're going to have to turn to the Supporters Club where you can join for ad-free episodes and that bonus content. So we won't waste any more time. We'll get into it um, with this piece from Edward Luce in Washington uh, for the Financial Times, essentially saying, you know, back when Bill Clinton was in charge, Back in 1996, there was a kind of a, a famous moment where he turned to an aide and goes, hey, who's the fucking superpower here? Like, you know, America is still the superpower in this relationship. Four U.S. presidents later, nobody can think of posing that question to Israel's pugilistic prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu, longest, long ago, established what military analysts called escalation dominance over whoever sits in the Oval Office, none more so than Joe Biden. And, you know, essentially he has been able to play Washington and Joe Biden specifically uh, quite successfully. And we, we kind of touched a little bit on the missile attack on the Tuesday show as it was happening. You know, it seems to have you know mostly hit three air base targets, one kind of in near from Tel Aviv, one from uh, Mossad, which was used in the, you know, the justification for that is they were behind the killing of Hassan Nasrallah and the killing in Tehran, the bombing of the embassy as well. And they also bombed the Nevitim Air Force Base, where the U.S. drops off their supplies, their F-35s and things like that. And so, f- you know, I think the if I had to bet, and again, there's no way of knowing for these things, you know, the U.S., you know, sorry, Iran says 90% of rockets to their targets. Israel says 99.999%, you know, were shot down by the Iron Dome with the David Sling. But the question, you know, the the... The the likelihood is that it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 60, 70 percent, 80 percent, maybe, you know, there were some real videos out there that were verified of them hitting impact. And, you know, there's been videos coming out of the craters that those impacts have created. So, you know, this is something that is did happen and you know probably not as much as the Iranians say, but it did happen. So that is definitely a part of that, you know, kind of in play and how that could translate to, you know, the U.S.'s broader incentive to try and keep Israel, you know, safe, so to speak, but also to, you know, in a, in a large respect, to keep the U.S. out of kind of regional trouble. And really, Biden has handled this quite awfully. Um, on Thursday, Biden admitted he was in discussion with Netanyahu about an Israeli strike on Iran's oil fields. Iran has in the past signaled that it would tally to any such strike with attacks on infrastructure in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which they could absolutely do because how do I know? They've done it before. They spent the past, you know, seven, eight years. This is, you know, this is how they were able to get the Houthis to win in Yemen. They spent, you know, the past seven, eight years striking these oil fields within Saudi Arabia, especially, you know, I always remember like there's like F1 qualifying going on in Riyadh and in the background, there was smoke from these strikes 
So, you know, th- this is definitely something they're capable of doing and something that they will do, um, which is really going to cause an oil crisis, not just if Iran's, you know, Iran's only, I believe, like 3% of the global oil production, uh, which is significant, but, you know, it's 3%. But the the Brent price of oil, you know, has already risen from seventy dollars a barrel to seventy eight in from Monday to Friday of this week. A new round of strikes could send it hurtling toward one hundred. Asked about such a prospect, all Biden could do was interrupt himself, saying, "Quote: I think that would be a little anyway." <laughs> it's just like, ugh, you know, like that is some brutal, brutal stuff. What Biden may have stopped himself from adding is that such an ex- escalation could badly damage Kamala Harris's chances of beating Donald Trump next month. And this is, you know, the the real big question is, is how much is Biden steering the ship? And how much is he, you know, day to day making these decisions? And I think, you know, the, the, the Occam's razor situation, the most likely answer is that he's probably not doing a lot of decisions here. So the question is, who is? And what I really want to know is what is going on in Biden's brain as he's seeing this happen and he's unable to stop, you know, what his advisors are doing in terms of, you know, essentially signing off on everything that Israel does as they push closer and closer to this conflict here. Like, you know, it, what what must he be thinking sitting, sitting inside of Oval Office and watching, you know, Jake Sullivan get on the phone and be like, you know, hey, send send more bombs to Lebanon. You know, it, it, it won't be bad. You know, and it's just like. Netanyahu, do whatever you want, and then watch, send, you know, create a global oil crisis. It's no big deal, you know, because uh, I have to assume that's what's happening. Because, you know, just th- this is what we're getting out in public. Like, it's it's not very convincing that he's the one that's really kind of in charge of this, so to speak. Um, really, do wonder, you know, what must he be thinking? Um, Netanyahu still, by the way, I think it's it's important to say the the latest Israeli polls show that his Likud party would be the largest if a snap election were held now. A large majority of Israelis are opposed to a two state solution with the Palestinians, which Biden has insisted must be Israel's end goal. So Netanyahu has consistently refused to specify the day after political settlement for the Gaza war that Biden has been urging on him. So, you know, again, because what do you think that freaking day after settlement is? It's a takeover. Like, it's these people. Like, come on. It's just like, you know, it, it, again, the big question, like, you, if you do kind of a, a power mapping situation here, which is always my, my first instinct to do, it's like, you know, how much does Biden play on this? And, you know, if you, again, are the figureheads for Biden, you're talking about Blinken, you're talking about Jake Sullivan, you're talking about, you know, Amos Hochstein, Brett McGurk. Um, you know, you got all these people who are, you know, kind of seen to be, at least in reports, leading the Middle Eastern policy on this. Like, what is their mindset? Like, you know, I think that's it becomes very, very important to know. And how does that change with with Kamala? And it's just like if, you know, they are it really just it's mind boggling how it just seems to be so much not in their interest on any level, whether it be the American level, the the global, it just seems to be so purely based on uh, Israel's interests. And, you know, it's, when it comes down to it, I don't think Joe Biden has, you know, much to do with any of it. And I think broadly, the U.S. policy here has been um, this kind of help me help you, I mean, you being Israel, you know, buy you some more time. And that's how they are, you know, choosing to do this now by kind of, continuing to burgeon continued support behind israel and this we get this you know kind of concerned tone from edward loose this kind of framing of outwitted you know we get this oh they're, they're just being completely outwitted you know biden he's a doddering old fool which is you know certainly true but i also think some of the people even his administration are not too broken up shall we say you know because i think a lot of it is this kind of imperial you know for lack of a better word this imperial arrogance of you know yeah we can take down iran like they're weak they're our enemy we can come down and take him they don't realize you know the 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 world of shit that we have gotten into trying to take down much lesser foes like you know they they think they can just wipe their hands of them really easily get into another war so they're saying yeah you know why don't we take a global oil crisis on the way and they're acting as if, oh, you know, Netanyahu, uh, you know, he beat us again as they truly get everything that they want, which is complete U.S.-Israel control over the Middle East with no force standing in the way of their killing and expansion. So I think, you know, it's definitely something to keep in mind. And I think that's probably a, a driving principle behind it when, you know, when you look at the behavior, not the rhetoric, you know, more often than not. 
Um, it'll be interesting to see, of course, how things change with Kamala, but I bet not very much. Um, but we will have to be very, very, you know, we will keep a very, very close eye on this situation. But for now, I will say, good article in the Financial Times about this, you know, just really how Netanyahu broke through Biden's, uh, you know, just kind of outwitted Biden on this. But I think it is worth asking, is this outwitted framing kind of a convenient thing for Biden or really, you know, more, you know, I could believe Biden's outwitted, but for whoever else is running the show, um, you know, in his stead, are they outwitted or do they think, you know, in some misguided way that they can get a strategic win out of this, not just for Israel, but for the United States as well. So definitely something to keep an eye on and we will keep an eye on for it as news flash. You know, you may say I'm biased, but, you know, I don't say this about every show. If you want to listen to a news flash episode that is going to give you stories critical to understanding, you know, what happens in the future and, you know, what are really shaping our politics at the moment. I think you could do a lot worse than uh, listening to this episode. So hopefully, you know, you're entertained by these stories that I have put together for you because they are quite, quite important. And here's another one. This is how the, really, the State Department's pretty incredible weapons pipeline to Israel's leaked cables and emails show how the agency's top officers dismissed internal evidence of Israelis misusing American-made bombs and worked through around the clock to rush more out while the Gaza toll mounted. So it's just like, this is nauseating stuff. Like, this is, you know, stuff that, you know, kills, wantonly kills children, bombing refugee camps, killing hundreds of people at a time. And, you know, I really do – the Al Jazeera Investigates has a video of how the Israeli you know, army has conducted itself out, you know, actually a full feature-length film of videos and analysis of how the uh, Israeli army has conducted itself in Gaza since the start of the genocide. And, you know, that is a great way of putting in perspective to, you know, this. these are the people – watch the trailer at least for that. These are the people that they are – you know, the U.S. is working around the clock, that your government is working around the clock to send weapons of destruction uh, that you paid for, by the way, to – Israel at this point. So essentially it talks about U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Jack Lew, along with the other top diplomats in the Jerusalem embassy, sending a cable to urge the State Department to approve the sale, saying there was no potential for the Israeli Defense Forces to use the weapons. The cable did not mention the Biden administration's concerns about the casualties, uh, including dropping 2,000-pound bombs in crowded areas of Gaza weeks earlier. Lew was aware of the issues. Officials say his own staff had repeatedly highlighted the attacks where large numbers of civilians died. Homes of the embassy's own Palestinian employees have been targeted by Israeli airstrikes. Still, Lou and his senior leadership argued that Israel could be trusted with this new ship and a bomb, so as the GBU-39s, which are sh- smaller and more precise. And, you know, I, we, we've talked about it in the show, the many massacres that they've used with those exact bombs that are created by Boeing um, and, and sent over. Like, the many, like, some of the most well-known massacres of this, like, countless, you know, schools, refugee camps, whatever— have been with those exact bombs. Um, while the request was pending, even, the, the Israelis repeatedly proved the assertions wrong on sh- dropping them on shelters and refugee camps that said uh, they were being occupied by Hamas kill- soldiers, but still killing you know scores of Palestinians with these so-called extra-precise bombs. Uh, 93 died, for example, in early August when the IDF bombed a school in a mosque. That was with the GBU, and we talked about that on the show. Um on January 31st, the day after the embassy delivered its assessment that we talked to about on our, our bonus episode that we did, you know about if you're a member of the Supporters Club, link for that in the description. Um, on January 31st, the day after the embassy delivered its assessment, Secretary of State Antony Blinken hosted an agency-wide town hall and auditorium at State Department headquarters where he fielded pointed questions from his subordinates about Gaza, talking about all the heartbreak, heart, heart-wrenching suffering and you know, all that stuff, you know, the it, it, the whole Biden administration lines, um, you know, saying they are trying to make judgments and they're trying essentially to assure this is the line that he tells his staff that October 7th would never happen again. And this is in their minds. Um, and I think it's very telling that they're, you know, kind of coming out and saying this internally, their mind, the way they make sure October 7th never happens again is to essentially kill civilian Palestinians and to destroy this Palestinian society. This is, you know, this is the Joe Biden, Kamala Harris government. Um, you know, so the unwritten policy was to protect Israel from scrutiny and facilitate the arms flow no matter what, saying we can't admit that's a problem. This is a former official uh, talking there. Uh, the embassy was 
even historically, uh, even res- historically resisted accepting funds from the State Department's Middle East Bureau, earmarked for investigating human rights issues throughout Israel, because embassy leaders didn't want to insinuate that Israel might have such problems, according to Mike Casey, the former U.S. diplomat in Jerusalem. In most places, our goal is to address human rights violations, Casey added. We didn't have that in Jerusalem. So, again, not <laughs> the most unpredictable stuff, I will say there. You know, kind of goes through here, talks about State Department, you know, one of the first, I think the first resignee, I guess if that's a word, Josh Paul, who was talking about how, yeah, we tried to raise objections, but my superiors essentially signed off right over my head. Um, so you know, uh, Paul eventually goes and resigns in protest. Um, a group of experts in multiple bureaus said they had not been consulted before several policy decisions about arms transfers immediately after October 7th, and there was no effective vetting process in place to evaluate the repercussions of those sales. There were memos kind of being passed around, dissent memos um, that leaked to the media earlier this year, but they seemed to have little impact, um, which was kind of kind of funny. In the early stage of the war, the State Department worked overtime, often after hours and through the weekends to process Israeli requests for more arms. Like, how pathetic is that? And for all the people that say, you know, oh, Israel, they they don't, you know, like, we, us stopping sending them weapons would have no impact on their war effort. They're still going to continue to do whatever they want. It's just like, come on, hello. Like, are we, are we paying attention to what we are seeing right in front of our faces here? Like, this is just too too obvious um you know like this the, you got they're sending so many weapons requests in that the state department officials like you know they got to stay home and we, like these are the grunt workers probably that are just like you know, you know another bomb another bomb another bomb you know like just again and again and again like we had to you know rush ship like this stuff out and the fact that this all this effort was being put for such a criminal act and such a you know deeply criminal you know they go through the society, like, doesn't support a two-state solution. Completely is, you know, supportive of Netanyahu now, even. Um, so, like, that is that is just a sign of just this, what our government is doing for this government, you know, just knowing no, absolutely no bounds. Uh, but the State Department spokesperson said employees were allowed to accept gifts from foreign governments that fall below a certain threshold. Because, again, it goes for later on, you know, there's this, this, um, the the staff in the Arms Transfer Bureau walked into their D.C. office and found something unusual waiting for them. Cases of wine from a winery in the Negev Desert, right next to, by the way, the concentration camp, where the people that they are literally sending the weapons to are raping and sodomizing Palestinian detainees that have no connection in a lot of cases to Hamas. You know, right... At, right next to that is where they're, you know, picking the wine and sending them over to the stupid Americans that they're, you know, committing a genocide with the the weapons that we, you know, send them over. And again, I don't think, I, honestly, the more I think about it, the more I don't think, I think, you know, if you, you're the stupid one, if you think they're stupid, like they know exactly what they're doing. And, you know, maybe not the everyone's okay with it, but they know what these weapons are being used for. And I think the fact that, you know, they send them a little bit of box of wine right next to, you know, the, the torture camp um, from the vineyard right next to the torture camp. Like that, that's a little extra cherry on top right there. Uh, one month later, Lou delivered his endorsement of Israel's request for 3,000 precision GBU-39 bombs, which would be paid for with both U.S. and Israeli funds. Lou was a major figure in democratic circles, having served in various administrations. He was Barack Obama's chief of staff and then became his treasury secretary. He was also a top executive at Citigroup and a major private equity firm. The U.S. defense attache to Israel, Rear Admiral Frank Schlereth, signed off on the January cable as well. In addition to its assurances about the IDF, the memo cited the Israeli military's close ties with the American military. Israeli air crews attend U.S. training schools to learn about collateral damage. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, and use American-made computer systems to plan missions and predict what effect their munitions will have on intended targets. So, uh... That is, you know, that that's the kind of information you just read, and it just, I feel like it threatens to just turn you into the Joker. You just, you just want to start maniacally laughing. Um, you know, at the time, the kind of the early stages of the war, these dumb bombs, Israel using American-made unguided dumb bombs, weighing you know, 2,000 pounds, which many experts criticize as indiscriminate. But at the time, the embassy's assessment, Amnesty International, documented uh, evidence that Israel's had already been dropping um, – also been dropping at the same time the GBU-39s with a smaller blast radius on civilians. 
Um, at the, State Depart- at the time, State Department experts were also cataloging the effect the war had on American credibility throughout the region. Uh, Hala Rarit, a career diplomat based in the Middle East, was required to send daily reports analyzing air media coverage to the agency's senior leaders. Her emails described the collateral damage from airstrikes in Gaza, often including graphic images of dead and wounded Palestinians alongside U.S. bomb fragments in the rubble. Saying, quote, Arab media continues to share countless images and videos documenting mass killings and hunger while affirming Israel is committing war crimes and genocide and needs to be held accountable. Networks covered also the Israeli responses to South Africa's claim, stating that South African government is complicit with Hamas. They say these images and videos of carnage, particularly of children getting repeatedly injured and killed, are traumatizing and angering the world in un- Arab world in unprecedented ways. Uh, talking about this uh, girl named Sana Al Fara, um, you know they they link one uh, clip from this. It, this is an email saying, you know, hey, look, you know, they, they they were warned from every which direction of the State Department, but still, you know, from the from the top, saying we need to do everything they can we can to make sure October seventh happens again. And you know, the the message is here: it's killing little girls. Uh, like Sanal Afara, who loved to dress up as princess, you know, princess, as that was covered. It's one of the many, many murders that Israel has committed since October 7th. Um, she was reportedly killed in a recent Israeli airstrike along with her grandmother and other relatives. Uh, this is just one instance that they cited. Um, and Rarit later, unsurprisingly, resigned in protest, saying they can't say that they didn't know. And again, this, that, that is a big thing. They can't say they didn't know. You know and I think you know, these people... I don't know about you, but I think these people knew exactly what they were doing when they were, you know, and this, this shows they knew what the what the weapons were doing and the effect that it was having, um, you know, in every which way possible. But they still decided to send them anyway. And, you know, who that is and why that is, you know, I've already kind of offered some theories on, but I think it is going to be very, very interesting when it more comes out to light, because this is going to be, I feel like just it's a true, true, true uh, crime against humanity here. Want to move into some general regional updates pretty quickly here, um, and we can go to some of the uh, just essentially uh, latest, latest feed, I guess we could say, uh, from the region as the. October 7th mark comes up. An Israeli drone strike on the Bedawi camp in northern Lebanon has killed a Hamas military official along with his wife and two young daughters. And by the way, I think the most remarkable thing in the Bush administration, it's like if even back then, if, you know, uh, uh, Israel killed collateral, you know, collateral damage at the time, they would get condemned. But, you know, wife and two young daughters, for example, I hate to use the term collateral damage, but, you know, that's what they would call it. But, uh, you know, even the the Bush administration would come out and be like, hey, you know, that's, you shouldn't do that. Like, that's going to, like, they'd say that in the statement, you know, we condemn Israel for that. But now it's just like, the Hassan Nasrallah strike killed 300 plus people and nothing, no, like, that matters too. And it, like, as, as crazy, as, as stupid as it seems, you know, and unnecessary it seems for me to have to say that to, you know, probably hopefully the listeners of the show, the, the people of, Making decisions, the people in power in this country, they don't think that. And they, you know, they've been proven wrong about it, I think, time and time again, as their misadventures in the Middle East show. But they still, you know, because I think really just a deep sense of I'm better than you, like this kind of subhuman versus human mindset, like they they just don't learn and they just keep going. And they think they can control it all and deserve to control it all. Uh, Lebanon's health ministry says that 2,000 people were killed so far in Israeli attacks across the country. Uh, Hamas said its commander in Tulkarim is among the 18 people killed from yesterday's jet fighter attack on the occupied West Bank refugee camp. Uh, and more U.S. strikes for the Houthis um, uh, on the Houthis uh, in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. Iran's foreign minister, Abbas Arakchi, warned that Israel... Uh, is warned Israel that if it carries out an attack on Iran, Tehran's retaliation will be stronger than the previous one. So, uh, just in now, uh, we have some rockets launched from Lebanon detected over northern Israel. Uh, some of the rockets were intercepted by air defense fighters, um, saying some rockets also, the Israeli military said they hit open areas. Meanwhile, the uh, Iranian foreign defense minister, Abbas Arakchi, arrived in Damascus. Uh, as a solidarity visit. It'll be interesting to see if he comes tries to come into the Beirut airport 
where Israel has threatened to shoot it down. Um, sounds of Israeli blasts are, uh, can be heard in Beirut as far as Sidon uh, in the Beirut southern suburbs. No information on casualties yet. Really disastrous attacks. I think it's kind of not getting enough attention how devastating these attacks have been on the Beirut suburbs. So definitely something we're going to be keeping an eye on uh, as we continue to follow this region very, very closely. The strike on the U.S. ports uh, that shut down shipping on the east and Gulf Coast for three days came to an end on Thursday after dock workers struck a tentative deal with the port operators. This here is in The Guardian. Um, so the U.S., uh, the International Longshoremen's Association announced that the union had reached an agreement with the United States Mar- Maritime Alliance uh, saying that the you know, on wages, suspending their walkout until January, work would resume immediately, the union said. The strike, which involved 45,000 workers across 36 ports from Texas to Maine, was the first to hit the east and Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast ports in the U.S. since 1977. The tentative agreement is for a wage hike of around 62%, source familiar with the matter told Reuters. Both sides said in statement they would return to the bargaining table to negotiate all outstanding issues. Concerns had been mounting about a potential economic impact of the strike and threat of shortages. J.P. Morgan analysts estimate the walkout could cost the economy as much as $5 billion a day. By the grace of God and the goodwill of neighbors, Biden told reporters about it, it's going to hold. Um, which, you know, I think this is important to highlight here with this, with this strike. Um, Biden and essentially any other president have, could come in and put Taft-Hartley. And, you know, as much as I want to go as hard as I possibly can um, against Joe Biden for everything we just talked about for the last 25 minutes of this foreign policy. <laughs> I think it is absolutely clear that you have to give him a big amount of credit for not coming in and putting in Taft Hart. Like that was a, a historic decision that a lot of other presidents could have easily done. So Taft Hartley essentially is the bill that bans certain kinds of strikes that would really, you know, essentially damage national security interests and, you know, screw the economy. And, you know, that extrapolation-wise would be a threat to national security. It was almost kind of the assumption that that was what he was going to do. And he said, no, I don't believe in Taft-Hartley. And they did a very short strike and then got most of their wage increases that they wanted. And, you know, I think it is a little bit different to compare with the... You know, the, the dock workers, given their very, very strategic positioning in the economy versus other types of workers, and it's obviously a very, very different segment. But I think you know, there is something to be said, again, for n- not being afraid to use your power. I found that was very, very refreshing on the union side. I think that's something you know, unions can take away from that is knowing the power you have and not being afraid to use it when you have it, which, you know, I think a lot of people... It, you know, it's hard for you to really know how much power you have to a certain extent until you use it. But I also do think there's a lot of people, you know, in politics and in u- union culture that do have a lot of power and can shy away from using it. Although we've seen that changing a lot with some of the bigger unions in the country. Um, but I also think it's very, very important to say, like Joe Biden relieving that pressure and essentially paving the way for unions to flourish. And not, you know, it doesn't have to be coming out and be like a big, you know, Bernie Sanders style union champion, but just being there and allowing the natural momentum to take shape is a huge, huge thing worth circling and highlighting. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very, very noticeable and it's something that is going to be, I think, different with Kamala Harris and was really, really historic, you know, when he was in charge. So, you know, got to give him credit where it's due, even though I think he has done some really, really horrific things, um, you know, beyond the pale of any other presidents um, when it comes to abroad. Here is another story that I could have very easily led with that we are getting to in the 29th minute here. Uh, This is from the Financial Times. Wall Street is warming to U.S. presidential candidate Kamala Harris after weeks of behind-the-scenes courting between donors and her campaign, even as some executives still lean towards Trump 
in his plans for tax cuts. Leading Democratic donors and bundlers, including Blackstone's John Gray, Center View's Blair Efron, and Laz- Lazard's Ray McGuire, have been uh, fostering closer ties between financiers and the vice president. Many on Wall Street consider President Joe Biden hostile to business, but Harris has tried to reassure executives that she would be a moderate in office, uh, which I think is honestly is really sad because I think with Joe Biden, him trying to be and you know in a lot of cases succeeding to be left wing you know he couldn't exactly reap the rewards from that because of the fact that he was so old and representative of just you know such a decrepit political force just because of his age so he couldn't exactly inspire people in that way because it's like yeah sure you're kind of doing good things but when you're that old i think it's so hard to underestimate how bad the the age was and how he wore his age i think uh, you know, was for Joe Biden politically. Uh, Kam Harris has none of that. She has tons and tons of enthusiasm, I think, with the base. And this is why this whole thing plays into a broader worry for me. And I kind of want to get to this uh, with the campaign is because ever since, you know, she came and took over for Joe Biden, you know, I think the biggest, the core of the Democratic base, which could in some, you know, if you're making a, a, a kind of a, a potion or a, a recipe that include, you know, to, to end up with the goal of the core of the Democratic Party. You know, you're going to include to, in some, you know, levels of you know, differing degrees, very you know, arguably different degrees. You know, you could quibble on how much makes up, you know, what part, you know, which group makes up how much of the, Dem- of the core of the Democratic Party. But there's probably, you know, black voters, definitely, young voters, and, you know, just generally, you know, younger and <laughs> just younger uh, non-white voters and just in general. Uh, kind of being that core average group and the and also I would say to a very you know post postgraduate um, you know millennials like 30 40 you know tons of tons of white people in that uh, category as well that are you know also very much very much kind of key parts of the Democratic Party that turned away from Biden over, over Gaza and the fact that he was so old and just seemed so lifeless and that really hit his poll numbers. And they obviously came roaring back to Kamala. And they were so excited for her. They really wanted to vote for her, especially against Trump. Brat Summer, all of that. And she really had the enthusiasm. She had the political ability, the political positioning to soak up what would have been a lot of goodwill from some of these policies that Biden's doing that he, you know, she would be a, able to communicate a lot better on and be you know, because of positioning around her and because of her better communication, being able to take political capital from those risky things that are, you know, pissing off Wall Street. But instead, what does she do? Immediately cozies up to Wall Street, immediately goes to the establishment, goes to the mainstream. And what do they tell her? You know, oh, stop trying to paint Trump as extreme. You know, tell uh, Tim Walz to stop doing interviews calling, you know, J.D. Vance weird. Try to get him to agree with him and all that. So I just think it's like that is such... Such a you know red flag warning sign path you know for the way that she's going down. I think not only for the election, which I think is really it's it's bad politically for her because you know this this path, which I really do I think associate with her kind of cozying up to donors and her you know I, I could find it would take me a while, but I could find the articles you know where she's getting advice from these people being like, oh you know it's too negative for. Tim Walsh to be calling J.D. Vance weird too much. Like, you know, that's what the 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 mainstream Democratic consultants will say. And that is, it's, it's just, it's such, such bad advice because you're sacri- it's just like, what, what are we going to, you know, if we all get along and you're not really trying to, you know, push anything forward, not trying to make anything happen here, then why should I vote for you if you're kind of you know, trying to say, oh, we should all just get along, there's no real con Like, you're not making a contrast. The contrast was, and it was so good and so simple, in, like, July, when she first came in, it was, he is, you know, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are chaotic, they're weird, they're crazy, they're abnormal, and we are the cool, normal people, and we're just going to control the country, you know, like you don't want them around. And like that has been completely, completely taken away on the rhetorical level because you don't see, you know, Tim Walz and J.D. Vance and the weird stuff. You don't see this this real effort to paint the Trump administration as legitimately extreme, which they are. And 
it's also on the the policy level, on the decision making level, because there's also a lot of drifting back towards the center. There's also going going to where safe, going towards the mainstream, going towards the establishment, just as they are in this this kind of you know weird situation. Like let's not get too extreme. Let's not be too divisive. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be it's cause a lot of turbulence. Like no, like this is how you win the election, and things are already tightening up. So it is, you know, it is just a really bad, bad situation. And something that I really wanted to to flag because I think it's going to shape a lot of how this race, you know, kind of turns up. And I think you, you can see as this, you know, the the fall begins here, like as Ed's begun, you know, maybe around beginning of September, like you can really see as she starts to, you know, spend less time on the campaign trail, less time doing these big rallies, and she's, you know. The, being able to dodge questions quite a bit better. She then very, you know, very easily is able to have, you know, people, you know, Motorola types, you know, Motorola and CVS CEO to her house. And, you know, the Greg Brown and Charles Phillips of Infor. I don't even know what the, what the hell that is. Um, but essentially Kamala, they're, they're sending a big single to finance executives close to Harris said she had reassured them that she could appoint new officials to the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Federal Trade Commission who would take a less aggressive stance than current respective chairs, Gary Gensler and Lita Khan. So that like, you know, the, to, those, all these CEOs, you know, they just come over to, you know, that are being investigated by her administration are just coming over to an event and be like, yo, this is this is so tough, right? Like we gotta we gotta do something about this. Like and this is what Kamala Harris is. And she's starting to do it already. And I think it's better to catch us now than kind of be fooled in, you know, in the Obama style. Is she is someone who's gonna take a lot of kind of energy, a lot of anger, for example, at Trump's extremism and turn it into boring blah blah blah. Let's all get along, let's be Midwestern nice because the establishment told her to. And on the policy level and where it actually matters um, you know, she's also going to get take a lot of that enthusiasm for you know generated in this case by the Biden administration, and then she's going to go to where it's safe again. She's going to go to the establishment again, and she's going to have those people over to her house that are being investigated by the people that her administration put in there, and her and Biden's administration put in there, and have them vent, and then eventually fire the people that are causing her CEO friends trouble. So, and all the while again trying to you know cast off of this. You know, fun, hip, you know, we're changing the world type vibe. You know, we're not going back type vibe. I just think it is so phony baloney, you know, and it is and it is going to come through uh, eventually for the Democratic Party. I think it's already starting to come through if you look at how the polls have been tightening up. All right. That's all. We'll, we'll leave it there for now. I'm trying to fit another show this weekend. If not, back on Tuesday. I'm going to hit another show for next Thursday, and uh, we'll continue to keep it going as we are literally now a month away from the election how about that